Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the eDiscovery Channel. This is Tom O'Connor from uh, Stormy and Technically Challenged New Orleans, Louisiana, where uh, it is, of course, now hurricane season. So uh, our cable just trembles in anticipation is what's going on here. Um, and uh, joined, as always, by uh, uh, Rocky Messing, still in Tel Aviv, Rocky? Yep, hanging out in the nice, gorgeous weather over here. So. Oh, yeah, what's, it, what's your weather like? Oh, we're in the 80s, beach weather. Oh. Perfect. Oh, I don't want to hear it. Stop. <laughs> Stop. No more. We're, 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 we're not quite at 90, 90 yet, but we're at like 90, 78. So it's Out. it's borderline yeah. uncomfortable, um, approaching true discomfort. We're, we're really happy this morning to be joined by... Now, Meredith, I'm going to uh, show my ignorance I, before I... We just talked about pronouncing New Orleans. Please pronounce for me your last name. It's Mary, Mary Beth Bonashek. Bonashek. See, I would have, I would have, I would have butchered that. Totally. <laughs> <Come> <laughs> so uh, you are, and and again, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I I know you're with Ernst Young. You're the a partner in the Forensics and Integrity Services Department Division. That's right. Unit. Is that correct? Okay. And you are located, and this is where truly international today, you are still in Cologne, Germany? Western I am. Germany? I am. Wow, okay. So that's my first question for you is, I know that you, you did your undergraduate work at Texas A&M, and, and then Gigum. Got, amazingly got a, um, as I understand it, an MBA and a JD from St. Mary's. Home of I, Judge Was Judge Rodriguez teaching when you were there? I went to the night school there. I don't believe that he was. Ah, yeah, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how long. Yeah, cool. Okay, and then I know you worked briefly or for several years at a at a, at a firm in, in North Texas. Okay, right. North Dallas, Northern Dallas. Um, how did you get there for, to, <laughs> what's the, yeah, I know you can move east from world. Dallas, but. Yeah, I mean, the first you go east from Dallas, there's like Shreveport, and there's Arkansas, and then there's the East Coast, but you just kept on going. And I also saw you, you're, you're listed as a solicitor of England and Wales. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, geography is not my strong suit, but Cologne is not in either England or Wales. So what's going on here? Tell you us what's going on. Let's, let's start at the beginning. beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've done your homework. You've done your homework. Right. So I did. I started off um, doing um, litigation in Dallas, where I was born and raised. And you ah. know that uh, love will take you all around the world. I and do indeed. Uh, my ancestors originally came from the Czech Republic. And so when I was in university at Texas A&M, I studied abroad in Prague for uh, a period ah. of time, cool. fell in love with Europe, and did a second study abroad because I had an internship working at a German law firm in Prague. And so I was asking, what do I have to do to come back? And they said, well, first, <laughs> German. And so then I had another study abroad opportunity in Germany because A&M said, well, either you can take the language classes back to back and stay an extra year in beautiful College Station, or you can go to <laughs> a language school in in Germany. And I mean, that's no, there's no decision there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. then I met my future <laughs> husband there. And uh, ah. blue eyes, uh, and very, very happy that it all happened the way that it did. But certainly a curveball for my family, and a lot of let's say risk. Maybe I was too young to recognize the risk I was taking in moving to another jurisdiction, but it all worked out in the end. And and I'm sorry. So where did the solicitor of England and Wales? Where did that fit in? So when I first came to Germany, I was unemployed for a year. And for a workaholic, uh -huh. that is like the worst case scenario, uh -huh. right? So I had already called my parents and was like, okay, this was a big mistake. I'm on my way back. 
And right at that time, I, I mean, my my future husband was uh, in the evenings searching for places, like searching for jobs, people who had connections to the U.S. And it was literally at the last, last minutes that I was connected with a, a wonderful gentleman at a law firm in Cologne. Um, and he had mentioned, well, we were helping a client, um, a bank. Uh, which was nice because I would I had been representing banks in Texas who um, need some help. It was the financial crisis time, and so this was a fantastic uh-huh. opportunity. Like case is a first impression. I got to understand the the way that a German company is set up, which is different than a, a U.S. company. But they had litigation in the U.S. Right. and also in London. So I was flying into London for the case management conferences really learning a lot about the the British law. And I thought, well, okay, why don't I just take the bar exam and become a solicitor? And my husband, my God bless his soul with all my crazy ideas that I come up with. At that point in time, we already had a little son. And so he helped me for one year balance life, work at a big law firm, because by then I had moved and studying for this second bar exam. And so this was crazy time. I didn't even pass the first part on my first try. Um, You know, so it wasn't easy. But I think it's pretty cool to have like the US, the UK, and now like this German approach, this like trifecta of these like big jurisdictions where you can like really advise clients from, from different angles, you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, and I think it's impressive because, you know, in the U.S., you see, you know, Joe Fedorci admitted in Michigan and Iowa. <laughs> and then you look right. at your thing. Yeah, I'm a solicitor in England and Wales and I practice in Germany. And, you know, yes. yeah. OK, I, I, I am. I am very much feeling under achievement right now. So. No, please don't. Uh, please don't. I, I haven't passed the bar anywhere. Come on. <laughs> Maybe that means your normal Rocky. Uh, that, that be, yes. Yes. You know, I think dad, that's a my plus. Dad always, my dad made made me swear. My dad was an attorney. My aunt was an attorney. Okay. Like it, it runs in the family. And my dad made all of his kids swear that we would never, ever, ever go to law school. So we didn't. Ah. We just got into legal technology instead. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Which is the fun part, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. We're hey, we're having a good time, so no complaints. <laughs> but um, okay, so you end up in Germany. You your work at you passed finally the bar in in the UK. Yeah. Um, at that point, you had switched to the law firm, and were you still though doing work in the UK as well, and and kind of going back and forth, or at that point, what where where was the law firm based? Was it based in in Germany or in the UK? Yeah, I was in Germany. So I okay. was um, living in in North Rhine-Westphalia, so the city where Cologne and Dusseldorf are located. Um, but the law firm um, was in the law firm had an office in Dusseldorf, but then the, the main team was in Frankfurt. So I was um, a couple of days a week in Dusseldorf and then a couple of weeks in, in Frankfurt. Um, And there I was in the International Arbitration and Litigation Group. Mm -hmm. And this was like really important. I think when I look back at my career, like very important for me, because I thought whenever I left the U.S. that I was like giving up the dream to work in big law. Right. And these were like the conversations I was having with my husband before, like why? Like I can't move to Germany because I'm not a German lawyer. Right. And so when I moved, I always felt like that I had like given up something. And so to really have that chance to be in big law in Germany, I mean, this for me was like checking like a very important box for my like mental, you know, Stability. bucket right. list, you know, yeah. that I, did, I I moved and I didn't have to give up anything. And maybe, maybe I wouldn't have even been good enough to make it in big law in the U.S., but in Germany, there was like this difference. There was this, uh, the U.S. side that you could see, which involved e-discovery, of course, right? Mm. And um, I always liked e-discovery because in those cases, you, it didn't matter what rank you were, you could always be the person who found the silver bullet, 
you know, right. like the lowest ranking person or the partner, like anybody on those MDR teams um, could find the magic bullet that would like change the case strategy, you know, or could then like piece together. And this was always like the cool part um, for me. Right. Now it was, I mean, obviously there's some major differences in the law in general between the U S and the UK and, and, and Germany. Um, but from an e-discovery perspective, especially then, I mean, we're talking 10, you know, 10 years ago, uh, yeah. 10 plus years ago, uh, you know, e-discovery was not a, I mean, most people even today in Germany and the UK still don't know what e-discovery disclosure are. Um, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't picked up in the same way. I mean, I think the need is there, but the recognition of that need is, is still very much something that, that the attorneys, barristers are, are unaware of and unaware of the capabilities. You coming in with that knowledge, the ability, you know, that 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 uh, technical discipline there. Um, did you find that that gave you a leg up? I mean, you you talked about it in terms of how how it was a uh, uh, you know the ability to be the person on any individual case, but in in terms of the recognition from the firm. Um, were they able to actually appreciate and recognize the the abilities that you were bringing to the table? Yeah, I, I rem like at the firm in Dallas, I remembered that whenever a complex case came in that involved e-discovery, this needed to go to certain lawyers to handle like the hard case, right? Mm -hmm. And this just made me want to know what this e-discovery stuff was, right? <laughs> So this just like, and so when I came to Germany and was working in-house, you could under, you could see that they didn't understand what it meant that we're going to be doing U.S. e-discovery, right? So I can, re I can recall conversations in the first days about, okay, you could, you know, call IT, this one guy in IT can help you part-time. Right. And you're thinking in the back of your mind, like this is a really big lawsuit and I don't think you understand what we're about to like get into. Like it's going to be more yeah. than the IT guy um, part time. And actually it ended up being I, I did work with the IT, but the IT guy, but it wasn't part time. And we had a great uh, a great experience, actually, which ended up culminating in in an in an actual company, an additional entity that um, existed to help that uh, bank with e-discovery with its own clients right because when you're when you're working in-house and you have to go to the board of managing directors and ask for more budget for e-discovery for more like these guys start rolling their eyes at you whenever you they already know what you're going to ask right so if you're able to turn that cost center into a profit center this this is now bringing in the MBA experience, right? And right. Um, so that was that was a fun aspect too. Cool. Um, so, it, it, I'm curious. Sorry to interrupt, Rocky, but um, the the other side of that is the other side of that coin. Maybe is is security, which uh, my perception is that Europeans take much more seriously than we do over here at all sorts of levels. Um, has that been your experience as well? In the data protection space, the data privacy space, you mean? Yes. Yep. And I think in Germany particularly, um, I think they're kind of known. They have the reputation for being one of the stricter um, countries around data privacy, data protection. This was always an interesting to follow the Sedona conference and and all the thought leaders there to find the balance between what was uh, required here and what's required in the US. And I mean, I, I guess you can say like back in the day, you know, we already had through Sedona, a large group of people who had helped sort out some of those issues. And you had great people like Judge Peck along the way who really like recognized and valued um, that opinion. And now you see like a new kind of era uh, emerging with the Shrems decision, um, with the with the privacy shield, what will become the new privacy shield, and so I guess we're we're in essence uh, 
or in one way starting that journey over again, right? And who knows uh, if Germany will will remain the one who is uh, more strict uh, regarding data privacy. Maybe we find a few surprises on the way as more legislation comes out across the globe. Um, I would imagine also the U.S. will take a, a position on this at, at some point, right? And what do you, <laughs> no, no, maybe. Don't, you know, maybe. don't hold your breath waiting for Congress to do anything. <laughs> <Let's see laughs> that was how my question. Over here, we, of course, rely on the states much more, or, or I'm not sure that we rely on them, but it defaults to state activity. Um, yeah. Is it more monolithic in Germany? Is it more of a federal um, issue? We have 16 states, so to say, and they all have their own individual um, authority, and uh -huh. there is an additional federal one. But, you know, each of the authorities comes with their own personality um, and their own viewpoint or their own desire right. to speak or not speak up about an issue to the newspapers or uh, to, to do, let's say, audits. Uh, on certain companies. And so you see some variety in the same way that you would see it in the U.S. Uh, and where does the GDPR fit into that? Or does it? So um, this, so GDPR, because it's a regulation, um, ah. this is different than a directive. Gotcha. And so the regulation is automatically incorporated into the law. Ah. But there are specific pieces where the countries can deviate. An example of this would be um, a child is defined to be X years old. And some people might say, OK, it's 16, not 18 or it's 12 or, you know, these are examples that you might relate right. to from from the U.S. side. But Right. So, so that's a lot of balls to juggle, though, for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great, it's though, right? Uh, it's definitely trickier. And, and I think you know, for people who actually get it and understand it, it, it gives you a lot of opportunity to play that essential advisor role, um, which brings us to EY. Um, you know, <laughs> it, in, in the in the role that you you play today, um, where you are able to, you know, not just as a attorney for a law firm, but actually, you know, with a consultancy and advisory role, um, yeah. You know, how how how's that been going? You've been there for what, three, four years, something like that, right? Yeah, it's a really good fit, right? So it's not behind a desk writing memos anymore. Um, yep. It's like the entrepreneurial side is able to come out, like the creative side of things and talking uh, about different problems. I always think of it like a Rubik's cube, you know, where you can like turn a problem from a bunch of different angles and see like the different colors or different shades uh, of, of how to solve a problem, you know, but it's it was a good move. I, it took me a really long time to figure out, should I leave law? This is a big deal in my brain because I had like defined myself uh, as a lawyer. And so how could you like leave law? Um, but now looking back, it was if it's my personality better to be in a more consultative uh, role. Right. And and I assume that having the backing of the EY infrastructure doesn't doesn't hurt there in terms of, you know, that you've got people you can turn to and, and yeah. people who get it. You know, it, it's in, the, in a law firm, it can be tricky because you can be that person but you might be the person and that's it in, in, in the firm who really, you know, truly gets this. And, and you know, having the, the infrastructure and the resources within EY, the, the people resources yeah. of, you know, you've got a client, a multinational client that's got offices in Japan. Well, you've got, you know, you know that you have people there who, who get it. So that I'm sure is very helpful. Absolutely. It's the people, it's the technology budgets to do what you want to do in the right way. Mm -hmm. And it's also like maybe not just the people existing, but at least in EY, the fact that you actually talk to those people regularly, right? So I speak to the guys out in Asia Pac or in the UK or in the U in the US regularly. Like we have 
it's not just calling them up because there's a collection. It's like we strategize together. We, um, and this is, yeah, this is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. How um, do you keep up with new technology, Merriman? You know, uh, I was talking to Craig Ball yesterday and, and he said, you, you know, the things that change constantly, m most recently is say Slack and Teams. I can't yeah. mention. I can't mention Slack on the Teams channel here without you. you absolutely can mention it, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you know, it's something U.S. attorneys struggle with. Is the struggle the same with your clients worldwide? Yeah. Keeping abreast of technology is is monumental. Yeah, and I think um, in general, as a leader, you need to find a balance between project work and innovation for your team. Um, you need to keep them challenged, not just with topics that you know are on the desk, like how do we process Slack, how do we handle this, but also questions that the clients are not asking for yet, right? right. An example yeah. would be um, you can hear that people want near-time, real-time response to compliance, privacy matters, right? How do we bring that to them, right? And you see more of a sliding scale between reactive e-discovery to proactive e-discovery right, to uh, privacy technology. How do all of them interact? And how do you do that? I mean, you stay in contact with um, our strong alliance partners, Microsoft being one of them. Um, and also the tech companies, right? There's lots of startups. I, we look at so many demos. Uh, we, of course, want to be engaged with um, the new technology because even if it's not necessarily our technology, some of the technology companies say, can you come with us to market and be the consultants that talk to the people to use our technology, right? And this makes sense because if a company buys a, a cool new toy, uh, but they're not using it, and the com the technology company can see that they're not using it, well, let's go talk to them and figure out how they can maximize that budget that they spent buying the tool, right? It might not be for what the tool is intended to be. It might be a new creative idea. And, um, and it's, it's interesting because I think that approach is really something relatively new. Um, from the technology sector. It, it used to be across all of big tech and small tech, the, the goal was the sale, right? You, you, you wanted to get your technology sold, whether it was used or not, whether it sat on the shelf, didn't matter. Um, and, and you've really seen a shift um, over the last five, six years, probably in, in, in strength. Uh, but even a little bit before that, where you're getting the technology companies aren't just interested in making the sale, but they realize that if then it becomes a one time thing, right? Because the client's right. not going to buy anything else from them. Um, yeah. But I think that's really where the consultants and you know the partners come into play because it, the corporations in general, the 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 staff is so resource constrained and so busy. They don't yeah. have the time to truly dig in and figure out, OK, how do I make this work for me? Um, and, yeah. and being able to rely on someone like you is is really, really essential. Um, I, I have a question for you. Where did you get your interest in technology? I mean, obviously, you know, you started looking at e-discovery and things when you're in, still based in, in Texas. but. Were you always interested in technology? Was that something that just kind of, you know, came over the years? How how how'd that come about? I think it's like the the curiosity that that comes with this um, this understanding that even the youngest person on the team can find the silver bullet, right? So. Um, I wouldn't say maybe all of technology, but at least uh, the e-discovery technology, right? And somehow this tech technology and law intersection and being able to do something more efficiently and uh, in, a, in a way that you can present it in a more beautiful way, there's just something modern and fresh and, and cool about it, right? 
or being able to look into your team and like the young the young guns are the ones who are like describing to you how you should do it you know i mean that's just that's fun that's very non hierarchical um maybe a little bit non german you know it's not necessarily the way that it's done here you know but there's something like really refreshing. You can't be like uh, too old to learn some new stuff, right? And, right. <laughs> and that's the space. So, so as an expat, do you, what do you miss the most about the U.S.? Mexican food. Tex-Mex Mex food. <laughs> Guacamole, chilies, queso, uh, um, mm. margaritas. <laughs> Not so, too many places in Germany, I guess, huh? <laughs> that leads me to, to ask something that, People in New Orleans ask everybody, but the most important thing that we ask people who visit here is, where did you eat last night? How's the food in Cologne? Most you know people, what? we think Germany, we think, you know, Berlin, Hamburg, Frankfurt, Munich, you know, people don't in think Cologne. Cologne. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I guess most people think beer. Um, yeah. I would say that we're actually foodies. So we watch um, MasterChef and... Uh, and all of the Gordon Ramsay shows. Uh, we um, try a lot of new foods here and new ways of cooking and try uh, sous vide and try uh, with the with the iron skillet and make your own pizza dough and all these like uh, crazy, make your own bread, pasta. Um, this also that like creative huh. side coming out. So most of the time when we go, uh, when we go out to dinner, I don't assume that it will be better than a meal that my husband cooked at home. Right. Wow. This is also my diet problem, right? I will never be skinny. <laughs> uh, but yeah. okay. That's the problems that I have. Right. <laughs> but Tex-Mex has not made an appearance in Kelowna. We've tried. We've tried. I still have not mastered the perfect uh, tortilla, right? Uh, you can't get a packaged tortilla and expect it to be like yeah. at Mi Cocina yeah. or Mambo <laughs> Taxi, you know, yeah. or good queso. Uh, we don't have Velveeta here to make like a sausage <laughs> dip, off, yeah. you know. <laughs> but yeah. we have beer. We have beer. Plenty of beer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they do you um do you watch MasterChef in German or do you pretty much watch uh, English English TV? So we normally watch English TV or YouTube or movies in English mm -hmm. or original language, I would say. But around the house, it is very much uh, we would say Danglish, so a mix between Deutsch and English. Right. And it's not so my husband will talk to my son in German. My son will talk to me in English, but sometimes German. I talk to my husband in English, who's an English teacher. And so it's very mixed. Even the sentences can contain half English, part German yeah. words, um, which probably uh, annoys people like listening in <laughs> on some of those comments. But we know what we're saying. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I find that that it's very much um, at this point in time, I've got like 80% capacity in Hebrew and 80% capacity in, in English. And yeah. my, my English has gone down, my Hebrew has gone up, but I can't talk correctly in, in either one at this point. So yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Funny. So. Um, and, and how often, do you, well, pre-corona, how often were you making it back to, to the U.S.? I mean, Relativity Fest was always the chance to go to beautiful Chicago in the yeah. autumn break here, right? This coincided with the vacation time here, so this was uh, always a highlight. And then there was also, of course, Legal Tech, usually at the beginning of the year. So you could kind of time some of those conferences uh, with a short trip back home, um, right. on years that you were lucky, maybe three times. If we have like our executive conference out in Florida, um, but of course during COVID time, this was yeah. you know came to a screeching halt. Um, looking hey, forward to getting back. Of, to of New York, I noticed you didn't say beautiful New York because legal tech is <laughs> always in the middle of a blizzard. Um, <laughs> What that's my, la my the last legal tech I think I was at was that one where it you know it, the temperature dropped to about two overnight and it snowed like crazy and oh it was awful 
But Rocky, you remember we had to walk up to that cigar yeah. shop and it was like like and walking it, up it was, Himalaya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was coming down. It was freezing, uh, and of course no uh, one was dressed for it. So yeah, and yeah, and we're all wearing yeah. I got like my 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 heavy duty New Orleans shirt on. Um, oh, how's yeah. the weather in Cologne? What's the weather like there? So right now it is um, summertime, like, and that means proper heat. Uh, it's not raining, right? Because sometimes it's a little bit, uh, let's say, British weather, let's say during the springtime. Uh, but the, uh -huh. the summers here are so wonderful because the sun comes up early and the sun goes down late at night. And it's just perfect for sitting on patios and like having an outdoor uh -huh. barbecue. You know, so this is like the best part. I moved to Germany in October. And yeah. this this is like a very bad decision because basically from October until March, it's pretty gray, right? Like um, Seattle. But, yeah. but as soon as the sun comes out, I think all the Europeans rush to get on a patio, drink rosé wine outside. <laughs> you know, this is no nice, air conditioning, yeah. though, Tom. I mean, this is, you know, the heat that can come in Texas or yeah. in the south. There's not yeah. really air conditioning here. So... This can be brutal a couple of weeks uh, out of the year, but nice. yes, yeah. But you don't have tornadoes or hurricanes, so you get we don't have going. tornadoes or hurricanes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Helps. <laughs> that That's helps. right. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, in, in terms of of being an American in Germany. Um, and, and I don't know if you have German citizenship also at, at, at this point, yeah. but Okay, so um, how do you find in terms of clients, um, you know, do they, do they take that as a plus? Do they take that as a, oh, you're American? <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of what's the, what's yeah. the, when you, when you first have those interactions, uh, what, what do you find the reactions as an American in Europe are? So I think it should not be assumed that everyone will be thrilled uh, that you are an American showing up and that they're graced with your presence, right? <laughs> and I think there are certain um, ways that you show respect, um, for example, speaking the language or trying to speak the language, right? And so this is a very complicated long journey, right? It's a big investment that you have to have traveling with you along with the other pressures, right? Because um, you will, you might, unless you're really fluent in a language, you're probably not going to be able to use the same words as in your native language, right? And especially if you're a lawyer, I mean, words are your art. That is your, so if you don't have your words, Right. And so there were there. I have to say that once you show um, that you're trying. Right. Then this gives you exactly. a long way. However, you if you if the person who's listening to you um, tries to give you a compliment and says, oh, that's so cute. Um, thank you for talking to me. And, you know, I'm not going for cute here. I'm going for right. professional. <laughs> right. And exactly. so there's. There's some like give and take in that relationship between like who you're talking with. Um, there's, I think a part of it is like uh, being a sincere person in how you communicate. And, um, you know, in the U.S., whenever you start to talk with someone, whenever you start a conversation, you don't have the pre-conversation. Hey, what language are we going to talk? Right. right? And so this is quite common that there's this pre-conversation. Okay, are we going to speak in German or are we going to speak in English? And this is a little bit weird if you're not used to it. Um, but, I mean, there are many Germans who speak English, of course. But it's always good to remain respectful and to keep the language skills up. Because there will come a time when your superstar client uh, has a person who doesn't speak English or doesn't feel comfortable speaking English, and then you have to be able to switch. Yeah. Um, my my brother-in-law worked for years for a company called uh, Alstom, and they were based in Paris, although they were incorporated in Switzerland. Their manufacturing facility was in, I believe, Hamburg. 
they, they make power plants or he worked for the power plant division. Yeah. Um, but he, he was responsible for installing them in China. And he said, okay. the, he said the language issues just became monumental because, of course, he said, and I, being the typical American, spoke none of those languages. Yeah, <laughs> right? very complex. Yeah, he said, it, 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 he said, and then and then lawyers would get involved for the contract negotiations, and he said, I'd just kind of be sitting there like the dumb American, like, yeah, all right, tell me when you all are done, and somebody please tell me what you just talked about. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so last question for me before we head into uh, into the final question that we're, we're going to end off with here. But um, how how at this point from a COVID perspective, um, where where are you guys? How's it impacted you from personally and and professionally? Yeah. So I would say pre-COVID, I was traveling so much. Right. I think the initial uh, response was thankfulness. You know, my body could recover and didn't I'm have to go from taxi to car you know planes trains automobiles you know and this was really great i could see also uh personally uh, my son's english getting better because i was around right uh -huh. even if i'm like in my office you know for however many hours a day um you know my husband still knows that i'm here my son knows that i'm here and not uh traveling somewhere mm -hmm. i would say that with the team um, I actually saw them more as soon as we got the team's video capability um, because we, I could see their face more, right? And so arguably, I saw them more. We had more interactions because I wasn't in the taxi or in the airplane, you know? And so, I mean, honestly speaking, I would be very happy if things stayed uh, work from home-ish and not go back to crazy travel schedule. Um, let's see how realistic that is, right? I mean, you know what you get into when you're a partner at a firm like this. And you also know that there is the value that clients have of seeing you in person and even sharing a meal with a client, right? To have a discussion over lunch in a relaxed atmosphere. You know, e-discovery is not always about fun topics, right? So to... It's not, you know, come on. <laughs> when the yeah. regulators, when there's deadlines, when there's complexities, like sometimes just having a meal together is is um, is a good way to clear the brain and like uh, determine uh, timings and schedules and strategy and things like this. And yeah, yeah. Little the right. and, yeah, little disappointed in in how quickly the vaccine was rolled out here. Um, you know, stereotypically, the Germans are good at logistics, uh, so would have expected something a little bit quicker. Uh, but I also learned during the COVID times how difficult it is to have for a person to have a strategy, right? So in a leadership role, you have to have a strategy. You have to be able to communicate a strategy, even in times of like panic, right? And when you think about how hard it is even to have a phased approach strategy, right? Um, or to not, yeah, just to come up with a strategy. That's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. Um, and to get, getting people to actually understand the reasoning behind the phased approach is even, even harder. You yeah. Know, yeah. To, to really recognize the fact that, like, we have a strategy, first of all. It can it, it, be really difficult to get the, that buy-in. You're speaking but, for the Israelis. Now, right, Rocky? <laughs> Israel was, Israel was, uh, did, did yeah. it pretty well. <laughs> so, yeah, but even not so, so, not even so that, much over here. <laughs> from a communication standpoint, it was still, there was a lot of pushback, and there still is a lot of pushback on, on yeah. a lot of the Oh, yeah. So, it was yeah. a great article. I think it was in the New York Times this morning about they compared the difference between two states, I won't name them in the United States, that took two different approaches. One rolled out the vaccine to doctors and hospitals and uh you know m medical centers um and the other turned it over to their counties to county health agencies and and the difference in how that impacted people and got to people in different areas and and what the vaccination rates were just illustrated you know so you know we've got 50 states and so basically we had 50 different plans uh, for how this was going to get rolled out and 
um, it, it, yeah, it, 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 it was problematic. It was problematic, but yeah, that's a great point, Maribeth, that it, it, you know, it, it shows the need for strategic planning and everything, <laughs> you know, yeah. we're facing so much disruption these days. Yeah. You have to have a straight, you know, you have to know how to establish a strategy. And yes. My, my dad was a, an educator at the secondary level in the United States. He moved up to eventually become a principal. But in the 50s and 60s, all of those teachers who would come back from World War II, they were also coaches. They got paid separately to be a basketball coach or a high school coach. So yeah. all my dad's friends were also coaches, and I hung around with them. And it was really interesting. I never could quite tell. Was it because of their military experience in World War II or were they taught this as coaches? But that was something they constantly stressed was have a plan, have a strategy, have a backup plan. Yeah. <laughs> and then when yeah. it fails, yeah. have a third backup plan. <laughs> backup, yeah. backup. Exactly. And they, you know, they harped on that over and over again. What's your plan? What's your strategy? And then, and what's your backup? As Browning Marian used to say, um, I don't know if you knew him well or not, Maribeth, but he was, he was great. He, you know, he used to repeat that statement that, no strategy survives first contact with the enemy, or as, or as Mike Tyson put it, everybody's got a plan to like punch him in the mouth. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but okay, yeah, so it's, Tom, it's in, uh, yeah. I, unfortunately, we are we have reached the end. So no, let's wrap this up. <laughs> the, yeah, we're running the words I always hate to hear because you know Rocky yes. knows I could just interview myself all day. Um, <laughs> that is true. And, and when so, we got a great guest, it is yeah, awesome. exactly, exactly. You, this was a this was great because you're 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 really engaging as well as knowledgeable, Barry. So that makes our job easy. Um, yep. Okay, before I ask the final final question, I've got one little one that I keep, I've started asking people right at the end: Beatles or Stones? Oh, Beatles. All right, there you go. So our uh, our our final closing question is. Um, if you could spend a day with anybody from our profession, um, mm -hmm. and I kind of mean that globally, like yeah. mostly e-discovery, but maybe, you know, legal in general, one yeah. person, they can be living or dead, um, but you could spend a day with them doing anything you want. It wouldn't have to be work. It wouldn't have to be, you know, collecting documents or talking shop. It could be, um, you know, going out to a great Tex-Mex lunch in, in, yeah. in, in Dallas, whatever. Who who would that be? What would you do? Okay, so maybe I start off with like a a, gr a bigger group and then we narrow it down. So All right. what, what if I just snap my fingers and the three of us were sitting in a, a, a really good Tex-Mex restaurant and at our table was David Horrigan and also Debbie Reynolds. Yep. And so also, <laughs> and also, Cat Casey. Like right. that would be a yep. great, great evening, right? That, that would, be, would be. There'd be some good discussions at that table. <laughs> and a lot of laughing, right? Yep. I mean, a lot of laughing. As long as, as long as Horrigan will do his Bill Clinton imitation. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. of course he would. Of course he would. <laughs> add Judge Peck in there and add Chris Dale. I mean, how can I pick only one of those people, right? Yeah, that's I a mean, great point. I mean, it would be nice to have a long, extended um, picnic in the country with 20 of your favorite e-discovery personalities. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. It would be yeah. great. That would be great. Thank All right. you guys uh, so much. Well, well, to dinner. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so now you now you got me making me hungry. <laughs> I, I was gonna say it, it's just a it's coming up on lunchtime here, and by lunchtime I mean really any time between ten a.m. and and three p.m. Yeah, yeah. And, and so yeah, no, I'm no, I'm really hungry. So thanks so much. What time is it where you are? It is almost five o'clock now. So Rocky, it's what eight or eight or nine where you are? Eight or nine oh, p.m. No, I'm just one hour ahead. Oh, so really? Yep. Oh, well, so that's not too, too bad. Well, thanks so much uh, for, so uh, for joining us. This was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully we'll get a chance to see you at a, a Relativity Fest or a Legal Tech or something in, in the future. Um, I hope so. Things get back to, if not normal, semi-normal. Yeah. I hope so. Thanks All for right. the guys. It means a lot. My pleasure. Thanks. Rocky, as always, thanks. 
And to uh, all our listeners, we will uh, thank you for turn, tuning in and see you next time on the eDiscovery channel.